and I serve as the Director of Stewardship and Vocational Planning at the Divinity School, which, as we say, is fancy Divinity School language for money and jobs. So I kind of work with prospective students, current students, and alums who are usually within their first 10 years out uh, on those two topics, money and jobs. Uh, I am an alum. Claire, if you're on, can you mute? Is that, oh, is that, okay, you got it. Um, I, I am an alum of the school, and I think it's helpful to know uh, a little bit about that because uh, it has certainly influenced the way that I approach this work. Uh, I graduated with my Master of Divinity from VDS in 2009. Uh, in 2010, was ordained as a minister in the United Church of Christ and spent my first five years out of the Divinity School working uh, 200 yards over from the Divinity School at Vanderbilt University Medical Center as a hospital chaplain. And then for the last six years, uh, have been back at my alma mater in this role. Um, so I'm gonna share a presentation. I do want uh, you all to know I'm going to pause every, every slide or two and just kind of say, are there any questions and give a chance for you guys to chime in. Because uh, there's there are always a lot of questions about these two topics of money and jobs, and so I welcome you all um, sharing those questions. And uh, as I am learning all new things technology-wise, like many in academia, I'm going to try to figure out how to share my screen so that my PowerPoint will work. Okay, hang on, give me one second. Try to find where it went. There it is. Okay, and. Oh, why did I do that? Okay, here we go. Bear with me. Learning the things. Okay, share. And then. Okay, so we're titling this Wise Choices, Stewardship and Vocational Planning at VDS. Um, so one of the things that we take really seriously at our institution is planning ahead and providing assistance throughout your time here. Um, you would have to be living under a rock to not know that this issue of student debt um, is a big one in our country and that higher education costs continue to rise. They actually outpace the rate of inflation and the rate of the rise in medical cost, which is something that we hear about all the time. Um, and for folks uh, pursuing theological education, as well as other what we consider helping professions, so social work and school teachers, um, it, it becomes even more of an issue because we know that the salaries that graduates from those programs often receive um, are not super high and certainly are not increasing at the same rate that the cost of the education in order to attain those positions is increasing. So we spend a lot of um, time and attention on thinking about wise ways to fund your theological education so that you do not sort of price yourself out of the work that you hope to do. Um, so at the Divinity School, we offer individualized counseling and consultation on financial matters. Um, related both to the educational costs, so in other words, what your cost, what your bill to the school will be, but also cost of living. Um, so Nashville, when I attended uh, 10 plus years ago, was a pretty affordable city, and we used to brag about that compared to our peer schools up in New England. We'd say, we're the, we're the, we're the cheap southern option. And while we're certainly more affordable uh, still than New England, the difference is not as great as it used to be. At some point, Nashville became a very cool and hip city. And along with that, we have dealt with the challenge of rising housing costs. Um, and so folks have to spend a lot more uh, time and energy finding affordable housing options in our city. Um, we help students understand their bill each semester and their total degree program costs. Um, we offer workshops, retreats, resources on financial literacy and federal student loans. We don't want any of that to be a mystery or a fog for folks, and we know so often it is. So we really work hard to make sure that folks have a clear understanding and feel in control 
um, of their finances and of how their federal student loans, if they're borrowing, are going to work. Um, and every spring, I'm actually working on them right now, we send annual personalized student debt letters to every student that has borrowed loans. Um, and part of that letter includes an estimated, if you were to graduate today with this current debt total, here is what your monthly payment is estimated to be, here's how long it would take you to pay it off, here's how much you would pay total and how much of that would be interest. So kind of what credit card companies are now required to do. Um, we give you all that information so that you uh, have a sense of what repayment would look like. And a lot of times that can serve to help students feel confident in the plan that they're uh, currently following for finances or Sometimes it sort of stops a student at the end of their first year in their tracks and say, wait a minute, if I multiply that by two or three, that's gonna make me really nervous. Maybe I need to come in and have a conversation about a way that this could look differently. Um, so we, um, we offer all, all of that kind of hands-on guidance. One of the biggest questions that we get from folks at this point in the juncture is how do students pay for their theological education? And um, it's a combination of factors and each student sort of has their own unique combination. So there's not a blanket answer to that. But the most common ways are obviously the merit scholarship. As you know, VDS offers generate merit scholarship support. And if you have been admitted, which you all have, you know what your merit scholarship amount is. Um, the majority of our students work and work quite a bit. So while, while the majority would say they work part time, Part-time is anywhere between 16 and 25 hours per week. Um, we also have a number of students who work full-time um, and choose to either work full-time and be a full-time student or work full-time and pursue their degree as a part-time student because that makes more financial sense for them. So there, there is some combination of, of formula in working and being a student um, that all of our students are playing out. I would say it is a rare exception to encounter a student who has stopped out of working entirely and is just a full-time student and doesn't, you know, doesn't work at all. Um, that has become a very rare circumstance in this day and age. Um, student loans, I will say that less than half of our students borrowed student loans in both 2018, 2019, and in this current year, 2019, 2020, and we are pretty proud of that fact. Um, however, it, it is not a recipe that works for everybody to go completely loan free. So um, it's about 47% of our students this year that have borrowed federal student loans, and we just work with those students to make sure that they are borrowing only the amount that they need and are borrowing an, an amount that they're going to feel comfortable repaying following graduation. Um, external scholarships and employer support. This is something that we, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but this is something we really encourage folks to research in advance. Um, so if you are, um, I'll talk a little bit more about external scholarships in a moment, but check with your employer because a lot of them will kick in money towards your education. We've had students that work at Starbucks throughout the course of their uh, divinity degree because Starbucks will kick in some money. Same with Home Depot. So there are a lot of employers out there now that uh, will, will chip in some money towards educational costs. Uh, personal savings. So we encourage students who know that they're going to pursue this education, whether it's some years in advance or whether it's some months in advance, to go ahead and start putting aside some money knowing that you're gonna have some, some costs as a student. Um, and we work with students from the time of application through graduation and, and even as young alums to develop a sound financial plan. So this is, this is the point that I'm really trying to drive home is that um, we wanna partner with you and helping you feel confident about whatever your personal plan is because your plan is gonna look different from a student to your left and a student to your right. Everybody has their unique set of financial circumstances and is gonna to need to create a plan that works for them. And we just wanna be a partner with you in creating something that's going to allow you to feel at peace and allow you to sleep at night when you think about uh, how you're gonna pay for, for your divinity degree. I'm gonna pause here before I move on and just see if there are any questions with sort of these initial couple slides that anybody has. 
And I can't see a chat box, Laura. So if any questions pop up, go ahead and let me know. None yet. Oh, there is one right now. I can what see it. Does, yeah. What does work study look like? What's work? That's a great question. So um, I'd, I'd say a, probably about half of our students that work in the first year work uh, as work study students on campus and the other half work off campus. It becomes more popular as you progress through your degree program for your work to move off campus because you either find something that's more connected to the work that you hope to do following graduation and a lot of that happens through field education um, or you find that working off campus you can get paid more per hour work study on on VU's campus uh, will typically pay anywhere from nine dollars would be the lowest amount that i've seen in recent years i think currently in the divinity school the work study positions pay either 12 or 1250. um and um i see another question i'll get to that in a moment um, there are work study positions available in vds there are also large employers on campus such as the library um, and the student rec center that are always hiring there is a website, and you'll get information about this, called hireador.com, which is a site where work study positions are posting. But I will tell you, if you ask around our community how many people got their job through Hireador, you probably wouldn't find anyone. Most folks either get their position through word of mouth, through posts in our VDS community group of somebody saying, hey, this place I work has another opening and it's great, um, through uh, you know, jobs in the Divinity School will be posted over, over email when there are vacancies. Um, and then the, the largest uh, hiring centers, so the libraries and the Student Rec Center actually just have their own application websites that you can go ahead and apply for even, even as early as now. Um, and uh, so we have this website, but I will tell you it's, it's not commonly utilized. Um, but work, work study is a great option, certainly in your first year because of the convenience and not having to, you know, if you're not familiar with Nashville, not having to, to try to find a job off campus is certainly helpful. Uh, but I will say that it becomes a less popular option as people progress through their degree program. Um, the average rent students pay during their time, boy, I think that's probably across the board. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, housing options in a little bit. Um, I would say that you know it depends on how many roommates you have and how close you want to live to campus. So I'm going to hold off on that question. And Claire, if you would, if I don't adequately address that, um, when I get to that slide where I talk about housing options, go ahead and, and hit me back and, and we, can, uh, we can talk a little more in detail about that. So we use this phrase a lot in the Divinity School of know your numbers, and it seems really simple, and yet um, you'd be amazed the number of folks who don't know in advance what their bill is going to look like in a given semester. And I, I, I really believe you should never be surprised by the number on, on your bill. We have the tools at our, disposable, at, our, at our disposal for you to be able to uh, do the math and know exactly what your bill is going to look like to the school in advance. Um, so you can see on, on the admissions website under tuition and fees, we have a list of all of the costs of attendance. So the, the per credit hour tuition cost, what the student fees looked like for the 2019-2020 year. Currently, we are estimating a 3% increase to that for 2020-2021. Um, so you can go ahead and estimate what your bill would be now using that 3% increase. Those numbers will be set in stone after uh, the board uh, for the university meets, usually in their May meeting. So usually by the end of May, beginning of June, at the latest is when we know exactly what tuition and fees and uh, health insurance costs will be uh, for the next academic year. So we, we should know those numbers set in stone too, but you can go ahead and estimate now at a 3% increase. Um, once you know your cost of living, and your bill to the school, you can absolutely create a recipe, do the math and figure out, okay, what's my money in and what's my money out? My money out being what's my cost, my cost of living, meaning my rent, how much do I estimate for, you know, groceries, transportation, entertainment, those sorts of things. 
um, and how much is your bill to the school. And then you can figure out how much money you in, you're going to bring in, how much you're going to be working. Um, and then if there's any gap, in those two numbers, that's where student loans would come in. And we encourage people only to borrow money to fill the gap. Here's the biggest secret that uh, is, is true across the board in higher education, and yet a lot of people don't know. Um, you can borrow conservatively. So you can do the math on what you anticipate your gap will be and how much money you, you will owe and how much money you're going to be bringing in through work and other, other sources. And if you, your math comes up short, you can go back to the Office of Student Financial Aid and have them package up an additional disbursement. So if you are off by a thousand bucks, if you are off by 500 bucks, you can go back and ask for more. But we encourage students to borrow conservatively because most of the time their math works out and they don't have to go back and ask for more. But if you borrow more out of scarcity of running out, you're likely to spend what you have in the bank. Um, so we really encourage folks to borrow conservatively knowing that it's not a one-stop shop. You can go back in the course of a semester once the, the numbers actually play out and borrow a little bit more if you need to. But if you, if you borrow it upfront, you're probably gonna spend it and you start paying interest on it from the moment it's dispersed. So that, that is one of our big tips is to, to, to borrow conservatively upfront. So creative ways to cut costs of living at VDS. So for a lot of our students, the cost of living ends up being more expensive than their tuition and fees, um, either because they have a generous merit scholarship or because Nashville's just becoming a little bit more of an expensive city to live in. Um, we encourage folks to get creative with housing. We have a couple of affiliated programs, the Friendship House, which is a community um, that is affiliated with the Divinity School. And it is a housing community which now has, as of this coming year, I believe will have three residences. Um, so it has grown exponentially since it's only been in existence for three or four years. Um, it is a program where students live side by side with adults with developmental disabilities and simply agree to live in community with them. So are not responsible for taking care of anybody, but they have a communal meal once a week. Um, it is asked that they, you know, develop a relationship and, and live as a part of community with these folks. Uh, we also have the Disciples Divinity House. So first, first chance at spots in the Disciples Divinity House, it's kind of like a, a dorm that I think houses 40 or 45 students, either in individual rooms or there are also some apartments. Um, and it's only a block off of campus, which is great. First shot at those spots goes to students who are members of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ denomination. Uh, but we, in, in recent years, have not had nearly enough students in that denomination enrolled or that want to live in the Disciples House. So after those, uh, after those students get first shot, then it opens up to the rest of the community to apply to live in that house. So you can contact the Dean of the Disciples Divinity House. They're linked off of our website as well. Um, or we can help put you in touch to find out about how to apply for any potential openings there. Um, Vanderbilt is unique in that um, most of your undergraduate campuses, only undergraduate students can serve as RAs. Um, well, Vanderbilt has positions called head residents, and those can be filled by uh, graduate students. So graduate students are able to be um, resident advisors had residents at, at our university. The application for that usually goes live late in the fall and interviews happen in January. Um, and the benefit of that is you get free on-campus housing in exchange for working in that role. And I believe you also get a partial meal plan and a $5,000 stipend for the year. So that can be a great option. We also have fraternity and sorority houses on campus and um, you can serve, you can apply to serve as a house director. So I did that for the entirety of my MDiv degree and it gave me um, free housing, free parking space on campus and a $10,000 a year stipend and also had all my food covered. So that can be a great option as well. There are other live-in positions that students have um, secured across the city, whether that's as an live-in assistant for somebody who maybe needs help with some of the, you know, 
basics of taking care of keeping a house, um, nannies, residential facilities. So places like the Ronald McDonald House, which is located over by our children's hospital, will have residential uh, live-in positions. Um, living with family or friends. And then the number one thing that makes a difference, um, and this is true of our, our colleagues over at Duke Divinity School, the number one factor in determining whether somebody has high debt or low debt is whether or not they live by, their, by themselves or whether they have roommates. Um, so simply having a roommate, having somebody to share the cost of rent and other utilities can make a huge difference. And if you've lived by yourself, the idea of going back to having roommates it may not be the most attractive. Um, I was 27 years old when I moved into a sorority house and that was not exactly how I anticipated living out my late 20s. Um, however, if it can make a difference in terms of you graduating with a significantly lower amount of debt, that sort of a sacrifice may really be worth it for you. Um, the question of transportation, we do not have public transit like Chicago and New York City and Boston but we do have it, we have a bus system, and with your Vanderbilt student ID, you ride buses in our city for free. So um, the question of do you really need a car or could you make it work um, with, with that public transit or with sharing a car with, with somebody else? Um, we encourage students to cut down on smaller expenses, groceries, cell phone bills, cable, internet, um, ways to, to share those expenses either with roommates or by getting on family cell phone plans. All of these little things that you can be thinking about to sort of cut down on these costs can really add up if you're talking about over the course of a two or three year degree program. And then part-time versus full-time degree program options. So if you have a merit scholarship that is 50% or less, you could consider going on a part-time track and keeping that same merit scholarship. If you have a merit scholarship of 50% or higher, the expectation is that you are a full-time student. Um, so, you know, if you've got a 50% scholarship and you've been thinking about how am I gonna pay for this, perhaps going to the part-time option um, and having more time to work and help pay for the cost of living could be a viable option for you. So something to consider. Let me pause here and see, did I adequately answer? So the, the question about what is the average cost of rent, it is across the board. Um, and so the, the affiliated housing programs, the Friendship House and the Disciples Divinity House are usually five or $600 a month. Um, and those are subsidized housing opportunities. Um, I know students who uh, live close to campus and pay higher rents and maybe have a roommate and pay $800 a month per person. Um, I also know students who live kind of a little bit further away from campus and have a house with two other people and pay $400 a month in rent. So it really depends on how many people you're splitting cost with, how close you live to campus. Vanderbilt is, is you know, a mile from downtown, so it's a more expensive area of the city. So if you want to live a stone's throw from campus, um, you're going to pay more in rent than if you move into a neighborhood that's a little bit farther away. I saw a chat. Um, I can't read the chat, though. Oh, there it is. Okay, got it. When should we apply for the affiliated programs or try finding roommates? So if you have, Laura, are they doing back to grad this year as well? Yes, and that is up. I'm looking at adding some more housing information pretty soon. Okay, and back to grad actually has a website component where you can look for roommates across the university. It's almost kind of like a, it's not a match.com, but it, it's similar to that where you can like see other graduate students or medical residents who are uh, looking for somebody to live with. So um, there is that component in Back to Grad. I don't know if it's embedded in the website or if it's still a separate website. It used to be called Room With Me, I think, um, or Room Together, Room Together it was called. Um, but there should be information about that when you log into Back to Grad. Another thing, we, when, you are, uh, when you accept your spot, uh, we encourage you to join the VDS community Facebook group because that is full of current students as well as some recent alums. And so that is a place where people sometimes will go on and say, hey, I'm moving to the area, would love to find a roommate or two. 
Is there anybody looking? Um, that is a really common spot for people to post when they have roommate openings and also to meet other people to look for housing options with. Um, I would say go ahead as early as you can and apply for the affiliated programs. So I would, con I would contact uh, Dr. Yako Haman is who oversees the Friendship House program. So you can contact him about applying. I'm not sure if they have filled all their spots for next year, but we always recommend applying anyway because sometimes people change their plans at the last minute. Um, and so we've had spots open up that need to be filled um, even when they think they've already filled all their spots. Um, so I would say it's not too early. I will say probably the next week or two, you may have a delay in people responding because all of our faculty uh, and administrators are learning how to do things online since our, our campus is open for business and yet nobody is supposed to be physically on our campus, um, at least student-wise. So um, it may, there may be a slight delay in people getting back to you. How does the cost of housing near campus compare to other areas? So you're gonna pay more uh, if you're near Vanderbilt. So uh, I have seen studio apartments anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 a month if you're right near campus, because it's also right near downtown. It's in an area called Midtown. Um, if you were to move over to one of the neighborhoods that's maybe a 15 or 20 minute drive, so Bellevue or Madison or Hermitage or East Nashville, you may find housing that is significantly less than that. So uh, studio apartments may be more like 700, 800 a month. Um, so you, you just kind of need to do a little research, research out there. Uh, if you choose to live off campus and want to have a car and not navigate um, the whole public transportation thing, there is a parking lot directly across the street uh, from the Divinity School called the Wesley Place Garage. And I believe an annual pass to that parking lot. I don't know exactly what the cost was this year, but I imagine it's right around $500 at this point for, for a 12 month parking pass. So um, that may be worth you trying to, to find a you know, parking spot every day that's four or five blocks away from the Divinity School um, to have access to that parking parking lot. Um, any other, did I, did I get all the questions in the chat? Checking with Dr. Mahan, okay, Laura's. Okay, you will receive back to grad line. Okay, good, good, good. Um, any other questions before I move forward and talk a little bit about external scholarships? Okay, so a lot of folks ask about external scholarships. Um, probably about a quarter of our students receive external scholarship support, um, meaning a scholarship outside of their uh, Vanderbilt Divinity Merit Scholarship. All of the scholarships that we are aware of appear on this website, um, which is off of our admissions website, and it's an external funding website. So you can look on there. There's also a couple scholarship search engines that are particularly helpful for theological students that are on there. Um, I will say if you are somebody who is not aligned with a particular denomination or religious tradition, it is a little more challenging to find external funding. Um, external scholarships are often earmarked for students who are affiliated. Um, and a lot of our students are not. So I recognize that that is a, a unique challenge to Vanderbilt. Um, research any and all scholarships for which you may be eligible. There are a lot of scholarship search engines out there. Um, the deadline for a lot of scholarships is usually around now. So anywhere March, April, May for the following academic year. So go ahead and be researching those sorts of things now because the deadlines are usually well in advance of when the academic year starts. And then uh, we've had students engage in a lot of creative fundraising. So we ask who are the individuals who are most invested in your education, whether it's a local church or communities that are connected to your vocational goals, you know, sort of the people who are rooting for you to get this degree because they know that you're either going to come back and serve them or are going to serve an organization or a community like them. Um, and approaching them to say, is there any way that you can provide support, even if um, that support is as simple as, hey, can you, 
helped me buy my books for a semester because the cost of books, if you add it up over four or six semesters, can really add up. And if you don't have to borrow that money in loans, uh, that can make a big difference. And we've had students even set up GoFundMe accounts. So, you know, we had a student a couple years ago who was doing uh, something called clinical pastoral education, which is chaplaincy training, and it's required for ordination in a number of denominations over the summer. And it's a full time work experience over the summer, but it does not pay. And so this student sort of explained what she was doing created a GoFundMe, and I think took in about $3,000 to help her pay for her cost of living while she was doing this experience. So um, never negate how many people um, are in your corner and would help you even with just a little bit here and there while you're in this. And there's no shame because very few people who graduate with a theological degree go on to make millions of dollars. Um, and so most people understand sort of the challenge of, I can't go into a lot of debt are, is there any way that folks can help me along so that I don't have to? I'm going to switch and talk about vocational discernment, but I want to pause and say, are there any more money questions? And, and know that if they come to you later today or down the road, you can always email me um, and I can address those uh, further on. This is not your one opportunity to ask money questions. All right, let's talk about vocational discernment. So here's our bragging point. Less than 10% of ATS graduate theological schools have a person on staff with 50% or more of their position dedicated to vocational discernment and career planning. We do, and we are very proud of that. We offer vocational discernment guidance from the time of orientation throughout your degree program and even as alumni of our institution. And we do that through workshops, through one-on-one -on -one counseling on vocational discernment, um, resume, CV, cover letter, job search, support, and coaching. So for some folks coming straight from undergrad, it'll be their first time engaging in a job search. And for some folks, it's been a minute since you did a job search. And either one of those circumstances, you can certainly use somebody to kind of bring you up to speed on the latest trends and resources that are out there. Um, we offer clearness committees, which are uh, for folks who maybe are feeling stuck in a rut, it is um, Parker Palmer sort of made these big. It is an opportunity to um, gather together a group of folks, mentors, people who know you um, or people who you just appreciate their wisdom and you kind of get to lay out where you're at and what your questions are and these folks ask you questions to sort of prod some deeper thinking um, that will move you towards clarity around whatever it is that you're feeling stuck on. Um, and then we also offer vocational discernment conversations as alumni because this conversation of vo vocation uh, is ever evolving. And so just because you graduate with your degree and get in your first role, a lot of times being in that first professional role after graduating with your degree causes new questions to arise and shifts notions of vocation. And so we continue to provide support for folks who are going through that experience as well. And I know that the current students kind of alluded to this, but if you don't have a sense of vocational direction as you begin this degree, that is okay. Because of the second bullet point, which is if you have a clear sense of vocation, be prepared for that to shift. Theological education is so transformative, and so notions of vocation are likely to evolve and shift for you during your degree program. Um, it is a rare exception for somebody to come in and say, I know exactly what I wanna do with this degree when I graduate, and for that not to shift, and they, they feel the exact same way upon graduation. Like, changes happens, there's a lot of sort of rug pulled out from you moments, there's go back to the drawing board moments, um, and we provide support for folks all through that. So either way, any place you're at in terms of what uh, you imagine your vocation will be, uh, we will support you through that. Utilize the resources that the school has. And then a lot of folks ask, so what does somebody do with a Vanderbilt Divinity School degree? And this is uh, our most recent graduating class. These are folks who graduated in the 2018-2019 academic year. So you can see that our largest uh, 
place that our graduates land is in congregational and parish ministry. However, I will say the average across all theological schools for men is 58% and for women is 37%. So at 26% for all of our graduates, we have a lot more uh, sort of variety of places that our graduates go than other ATS schools, but we still do a really good job of training people for congregational and parish ministry because that's still the number one spot that our graduates go. The second place is nonprofit leadership um, with the same number of graduates going on to additional graduate education. And so a lot of that is graduate PhD programs in religion, however, not only um, usually every year we have one or two students go on to law school. Usually every year we have one or two students go on to master of social work programs or master of counseling programs because they want to combine their theological education with being a therapist or a counselor. Um, and then other is, uh, is also at 14%. Other is anything that does not fit into one of these other categories. So that can be somebody who decided to be a stay-at-home parent for a little bit. That can be somebody who went to work for a corporate health care organization. Um, it could be somebody who said, I just need a break from using my brain, and so I'm going to work at T-Mobile for a couple of years. Um, other is a very, very broad category for us. 11% go into chaplaincy. That has been a growing trend, chaplaincy. So either healthcare chaplaincy, college and university chaplaincy, um, prison chaplaincy or military chaplaincy. We've seen a, a great increase in, over the last five years in the number of our graduates going into chaplaincy. Um, and higher education administration, so going back to work at colleges and universities in some way, shape, or form um, is another common placement spot. Does anybody have any questions about vocational discernment or where our graduates go 